Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to all of our listeners wherever you are on the planet. This is World Smart, a podcast of the Aaron Fox Law Firm. We are your hosts and Aaron Fox International Practice Group co-chairs. I'm Hunter Carter. And I'm Malcolm McNeil, and we'll be talking with partners, other lawyers, special guests about topics of interest in the law of international business and international business. Well, Malcolm, we have a very interesting guest today. We have a new colleague of ours who is senior international advisor and a counselor to presidents and sovereigns around the world, Richard Griffiths. And Richard, although he has an LLM and is a lawyer, also functions primarily as this kind of sovereign advisor. And I thought this practice and his work in various capacities would be very interesting for our listeners. So without more, Richard, welcome. Welcome to the show. Thank you. And I give a preface that uh, that I don't practice U.S. law and I practice U.K. law for the compliance part of it. Uh, so, Richard, I guess my first question would be, tell us and our listeners, how did you get into doing this kind of international advisory work for sovereigns? Uh, well, first of all, thank you for having me on the show. I'm, I'm really excited to talk about what I do and, and, and really am thrilled to be part of Aaron Fox. Um, so my my work as sovereign advisory is is indeed unique. What I do and what I focus on is advising governments and heads of state in a wide buffet of, of matters, including international relations, including uh, gaining foreign direct investment, and moreover, international law. I got into this, as most people get into other unique careers, through happenstance. I happen to be in Guatemala and was a young man living in, in Central America and, and found I was able to uh, help the government with my general insights and found from there that there was a real appetite for a Western educated and someone who had been around the world to help these smaller governments have capacity. So Hunter, from there, I went to uh, worked in El Salvador and then I started working for the government of Colombia, which was really my first entree into high stakes international engagement. As you can imagine, Colombia back in 2005 was a very interesting place to work. And everything from flower exports to its international image to the country generating a, a stronger international appetite for investment. And so I focused on Colombia. And from there, literally, I was able to move into working in the Middle East and across Africa. I will preface it by saying my career was always focused on developing economies and developing markets. So that's sort of my forte and specialty, the smaller countries, the non-aligned countries. So I'm thrilled as a Latin Americanist myself to hear about your background and know of your interest. We have this in common in the early 2000s. I was happy to work with colleagues from ProExport and various other parts of Colombia's government to promote the adoption of the free trade agreement and use commerce as a way to achieve peace in that country. Now, today, you've expanded much beyond the Latin America region, as I understand it. The Emerging Sovereigns Group, as you call it, serves in many areas. What are some of the interesting things that you are tackling today? Well, currently, if you're a football fan, I, I think I may have the best job uh, out there for any legal professional is I am the special advisor to the secretary general of the FIFA World Cup, which I've actually been working since 2017, so quite some time. And of course, the World Cup Qatar is 2022. Now, what would someone like me be doing in the World Cup is sort of uh, what people ask me. And what I'm doing with the World Cup is helping the World Cup serve as a soft power tool for Qatar. So soft power is an interesting word coined by Joseph Nye. It's really about the use of cultural or almost non-economic, non-forceful tools to have a country engage with its neighbors, with its region, and with the international community. So the idea that I am working with the World Cup is really to help Qatar utilized the World Cup to maximize its engagement with the world. And that includes my network of smaller, less developed countries. So the idea being is that I travel around the world on behalf of the state of Qatar, and I help them understand that the World Cup is not just a football game, but it's actually a coming together of the global community with a like-minded spirit. So it's a fantastic job. If you're a foreign policy fan or if you're a sports fan, it, it's fantastic. I dare say I'm not much of a football fan, 
and have embarrassed myself many times by being in elevators with, you know, famous footballers. And I literally don't know who they are, but I am a foreign policy fan. So they, they give me a pass on that one. So I, I do know the names of most presidents in small African countries, which gives me a, some gravitas in the office. I bet wow. you there aren't very many playing cards games where you can trade images of the leaders of small West African countries. <laughs> I am happy that Malcolm and I had Bill Ordauer, our partner who was general counsel of Major League Soccer in the U.S. as our first guest on World Smart. And so I think you're going to find that you have a lot in common with him and a lot to do. Malcolm, over to you. Sure. Again, welcome, Richard. It's great to have you. And I know that you joined the firm, I believe, April 1st. I've already said welcome in the past, but it's so pretty, pretty new. So welcome aboard. Well, tell me, what are some of the things that uh, you plan to be working on over the next several months? And uh, what markets right now are interesting or exciting in this sovereign practice arena? Uh, well, uh, let me start with the first part. We're currently working on some really fantastic engagements. And since I've joined the firm, we've been able to bring over some really high profile matters. Currently, we are representing the Ukrainian oil and gas sector. Very, very, very important project. There's a lot of geopolitical implications for the, this type of a project. So it's uh, very much a hallmark project. We're also working on a really fascinating matter in Paraguay that involves our uh, expertise within the State Department or expertise within U.S. law, but also international law. And a matter that we just brought on board is the uh, Zimbabwe matter, which is representing the Zimbabwean private sector. There is some sanctions work and some very delicate work with uh, with, a, with a country like Zimbabwe. And then I have some, we have some some, some very high stakes white collar matters that I've been enjoying working on with the firm. So if you kind of look at where we where we're working right now from Qatar, Ukraine, to Paraguay, South America, to Africa, we're kind of covering a lot of countries. And that to me is exactly the footprint that I want to see for the firm. I've been thrilled to see that actually the firm has so many specialists when it comes to regions that I never thought a firm of the size would have. I mean, when I'm looking at West Africa, we have a, a partner, Gerard Laval, who's literally one of the top international attorneys for this region and has worked all, all across the region. And what I'm always amazed at it within the firm is that the breadth of the international work. So in terms of where I want to see the firm progress, I have a big, big belief that Africa, especially East Africa and West Africa, are going to be central to the global economy. And I think that Africa is also of great interest to the firm, but also Latin America. You know, Latin America is a massive footprint. There's shifting geopolitical implications with the U.S., with the new administration. You remember, sovereign advisory is not just legal work. It's also helping countries and governments understand how to best maximize their relationships globally, mostly with the U.S. So when we're looking at Latin America, a firm like ours would be able to come in and help facilitate trade deals and help them position themselves stronger to gain greater alliances with the U.S., both in aid, both in economic support. So there's a lot of things that specialists like Hunter will start really engaging with in Latin America because, again, I think the firm is starting to recognize that its expertise is definitely required globally, not just locally in the domestic market. Of course, that's my specialty. So I'm always pushing international. Of course, if you had a local specialist in domestic, they'd be saying, you know, look at the market in the States. So I'm very biased by this, but I think all my international relations colleagues will be cheering here, here as we look at where we can greatly enhance our firm's footprint. I think that's great because my practice area has been primarily Asia focused, but I'm also now actively involved in the U.S.-Mexico Chamber of Commerce, which naturally is brought into the office clients who are Mexico based that are either looking at Southern California, Houston, Texas, Phoenix as areas for their growth. And that includes partners who are throughout Latin America, where I was quite surprised and gratified to learn. Have you had any experience in the Asian uh, arena? I actually, Asia is one of the more weaker economy markets for me, but I have been working a little bit in Vietnam, which is a fascinating, fascinating market. And I think I know the firm has incredible footprint in this region as well. When you speak about cultural diplomacy, which, of course, I know is a complex and interesting subject and in trade diplomacy, the intersection with politics or political alignments naturally comes up and probably presents for you some very difficult challenges. When you spoke of Latin America a moment ago, I was thinking about the potential for a free trade agreement that includes Ecuador, which is currently being debated, 
I'm on the board of a think tank, Global Americans, which has decided to take a very hard look at the issues and invite a lot of dialogue around that issue. But there's also discussions, and there's always a clever title for them, like the pink tide, you know, when there's a movement to the left, or populism when there's a movement maybe to the authoritarian right. There are shifting winds. My question to you is, with all those kinds of shifting winds, how do you strike the right balance in being able to promote trade and cultural relations, even when political relations might be particularly difficult? Well, the question of the political um, aspect when working with developing countries uh, should come up, and it's an important question, because actually it leads to a second question, which is more related to the ethics of it. I mean, you know, do we work with countries that are not aligned with Western or not aligned with the U.S.? And that's a very interesting question. And I, I think the answer to that first part would be that I think it's important to work with governments and work with leaders that you believe inherently are trying to do the right thing. That doesn't mean they're always doing the right thing because they, they do make mistakes. And that doesn't mean they are already have already reached a level of perfectly aligned with U.S. policies and U.S. values. Sometimes, sometimes a country needs to progress. And the progressive development of a developing state is very interesting to me because you can take a country that is in absolute dire shape and, and help them develop into a country that is enviable, for example, Rwanda. The question is, is always looking at, when you're looking at working for a country, you look at, is the leadership aligned with what your core values are? And I think that's very important for a firm like Aaron Fox. I think this firm is very aware of making sure that we're always doing the right thing. And that's what I like about the firm. We're always trying to do the right thing and work with the right people. And I think to the second part about the economy, I always tell governments and heads of state, where there's trade, where there's engagement, the politics will always follow, or generally that's the case. What I mean is, if there's good trade between the US and a country, say in Africa, if there's good balance and business leaders are working well together and, and there's a great bilateral engagement on the economic side, then generally speaking, the engagement will also happen at the political level. And that's because the interests are aligned. So I think that business and trade can be a great tool for countries to come closer together. Where there's good business, there's good relations. And that's something that I think is sometimes lost on countries. So I'm very much a supporter of let's get trade in there. Let's get U.S. business into these countries. Let's show the U.S. companies that there's a large global community out there where their products, services, expertise, knowledge is wanted and, and warranted. I highlight this even with a firm like Aaron Fox. We were doing a project in Sri Lanka and um, the government was actually really thrilled to work with, with, with uh, Aaron Fox because they wanted to work with a U.S. firm. And they want to have a U.S. Um, a, a, a firm because they feel like when it comes to rule of law, when it comes to this kind of a topic, the U.S. is certainly a, a market leader. And it leads me to thinking that with Aaron Fox, also that a lot of this work for arbitration happens in London. They go to a U.K. firm or they go to a German firm or a French firm. And I think now as the market is getting more and more attracted to a U.S. type solution, that Aaron Fox will actually start pivoting a lot of this work from London to the U.S., I actually believe we will be a, a leader in this because I think that the market is looking for a new approach. And I think our firm fits very well within that. So again, where there's good business, there's good trade. And where Aaron Fox is generally will be countries that are doing the right thing. So what you, I think what I'm hearing you say, Richard, is that we should be talking about economics, economics at uh, the business level, economics at the that are advantageous for both sides. I think that's the message I get. And I was going to ask you a more basic question. When you're introduced to, say, a sovereign representative for the first time, how does trust get established? How do they make the decision to say, I want you and I want you to be representative of our nation or our interests and we want to retain? you? Well, this is a fantastic question because I think the answer is authenticity. And what I mean by that is when you're going to represent a country, it doesn't just mean flying in on a weekend and presenting your credentials and leaving. It's really understanding the country. It's spending time on the ground. It's doing the hard work. And so it involves a lot of time in countries that are less developed. I spent a lot of time, for example, in the Pacific Islands, developing trust. And again, being authentic means that you're really there to help them for the right reasons. And they can tell, you know, these are very sophisticated people and they want, when it comes to law firm and advisors, they want top tier and authenticity. 
And I think with the combination of having a firm with great expertise, but also genuine intent and a real uh, approach that is based on really wanting to help that country, I think that it does transmit well. So the really, in short, trust is earned like everything else through time, through commitment, and through doing good work. And I'll tell you, heads of state and governments are a very small club. So you go from one to another to another, and they all are aligned. So it's a very delicate world because, you know, if you don't serve one government well, it's very difficult to start working for other governments. So it's important each country you work with, you do the very best you can because there's only, what, 183 countries? Your market's very small. (laughs) Mm -hmm. Richard, you're raising the difficult question for most of us international professionals, which when you bring up the subject of establishing or perpetuating trust particularly in difficult circumstances, which is that we've been very limited in our ability to travel and to be in person and to sit with someone and so forth. I have to imagine that's hit you particularly hard. Am I, am I wrong in that? Oh, it's been brutal. Um, fortunately, through the state of Qatar, we have been traveling. So I've been able to have those moments of engagement. But honestly, Hunter, you know, getting in front of people now that we're starting to travel again is like a breath of fresh air. The reality is Zoom is great and Teams is great. But when it comes to certainly sovereigns, it just they're not going to open up to you the way that you need them to. And I don't know whether it's that sixth sense or that ability to see what your eyes are doing. But when they're talking about things that are really bothering them, because remember, you're solving their problems that they don't speak to other people about. You really need to be in front of them. And that is absolutely part of this uh, this job. So hopefully we all have our double jab and we're all starting to recognize that by getting vaccinated and sort of doing that, that we're helping to get back in the air again. And I think this Labor Day, we had record flights. So, I mean, let's see, but it's looking good. I heard Andy Slavitt, the presidential advisor, who also was, I guess, an outside advisor uh, to Trump, but was a presidential advisor to uh, Obama and now to Biden, argue on his podcast that if you have the double jab, the first thing he would recommend that you do is get back to normal, get back out to life, resume your activities. He said that the chances for you of encountering a COVID-related problem are vastly lower than for all other forms. And I found it very encouraging. And I know you and I have been talking about getting together very soon in a particular South American country. I know we're going to turn to talking about that shortly. I just have one more question for our podcast, though, and maybe Malcolm after me will have one. And that is the connections. You know, when you're purpose-driven in one of these Zoom calls or something, that's all you're focused on. But when you're in person with someone, other things come up. Who do you know? You know, one head of state is part of a group of leaders from other heads of state. And most of the second tier, shall I say, nations do have a lot of interrelations between them. How vital is that to your work? It is, you know, frankly, the reality is it's it, most decisions are made, of course, with the head of state, but they're carried out through his advisors and those people that are in the background. And those are the people you really need to engage with. So it's extremely vital. And without those contacts, without those you know, knowing who to call at two o'clock in the morning when you have an issue, you really are stuck. And again, you know, back to the COVID traveling. I mean, there are things like the UN General Assembly, which this year will be very different, very hybrid. But there are events where I would naturally be at the, you know, the Davos, for example. And that's where in one room, I'm able to meet the president of Colombia, then go and meet the president of Argentina, and then go and meet the president of Sierra Leone and Liberia, all in one afternoon. And without that, it's very difficult. So these global engagement opportunities for someone like me and someone like the team that we have at Aaron Fox, it is vital. I think they're starting to come back, but I think, frankly, thank goodness I have the contacts I have because making new ones now, if I was starting out brand new in this career, I don't know. I mean, so I feel like blessed that I have had the ability to have these WhatsApp connections as our team, you know, we're, we're seasoned professionals. So thank goodness we have those because if you're starting out fresh, yeah, it's tough. It's tough for them. My contacts with Asia started in the early 90s. My first trip to China was in 93. So yes, it was about four and a half years of traveling back and forth four times a year before I got my first engagement that was a significant engagement there are little dribs and drabs but what i also found is i attended a conference where singapore vietnam the prc and taiwan were all there and i guess and what i learned through that process was navigating let's say competing interests among sovereigns i wanted to do sort of the flip side of the trust among sovereigns on the flip side do you find it challenging from time to time people know that you represent one country or another and that that may be 
let's say, create a, uh, I won't say an outwardly conflict, but sort of a conflict of confidence just because people are worried that they might be sharing things with you because you represent other sovereigns? Well, I think that it's a bit of a chess game. In international diplomacy, foreign affairs, you cannot work for all countries. There are going to be countries that are not aligned, and you really have to pick well. I wouldn't at this point name any, but of course, when a country like Qatar, there are countries that are not as aligned with Qatar. There's other countries that I work with that have other countries that don't want to work with them. So you have to be a little bit aware of that. But I think as any legal professional, they want to trust that what they say is in the vault and what you your actions are portrayed that way, which is always why I tell governments, frankly, PR firms are great to work with, but work with legal professionals. We have a different set of values and a different set of professional requirements when it comes to privilege and confidentiality. And I really believe it's important that governments working with law firms recognize why they pick a law firm to do their advocacy, because it's not necessarily just PR. And I think that as legal professionals that we serve in a much different level I have fantastic friends in PR. I am not knocking PR at all, but there is a distinct difference between a doctor and a chiropractor. Well, now I'm going to get in trouble because they're doctors too, but you understand my point, a surgeon and chiropractor. And I'd like to think that we have that little level of professional confidentiality above any other practice areas. So... Well, Richard, I think you make an excellent point there about the relationship between lawyers, public relations professionals, and people that do your very special job, uh, Senior International Advisor, about which we've learned a lot today. It's fascinating. I remember once being at a conference in Chile and hearing a lawyer talk about advocating before the Inter-American Court on Human Rights. I happened to be sitting next to a U.S. federal judge at the time, and we both looked at each other and said, wouldn't that be fun? And wouldn't that be cool? And that's how I feel listening to you. That that sounds very interesting professionally, very delicate balance. I think you speak about it with great sophistication and nuance. And I'm looking forward to collaborating with you more. I hope our listeners have enjoyed this, our podcast. Malcolm, I'm looking forward to speaking with you at the next one. And thank you again, Richard. It was great having you. We'll, we'll touch base offline too. Be safe. Be well Thanks, over there. Guys. Thank you. Be well.